A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor and privilege to warmly welcome you to the 60th webinar of the English webinar series of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. Significantly, it is also the 114th webinar of the BASL webinar series. Initially organized under the Secretary's Office and now by the Seminars Committee of the BASL, the series is conducted four times a week. It includes the English webinar series, which is conducted every Saturday at 5.30 p.m., the Singhala webinar series, which is conducted every Tuesday at 7 p.m., the Tamil webinar series, which is conducted on Thursdays also at 7 p.m., and the professional, personal, and career development webinar series, which is conducted every Sunday at 7 p.m. The BASL webinar series were the brainchild of the BASL secretary, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuria, and has been running continuously since May 2020. We wish to thank the seminars committee of the BASL, chaired by the secretary of the BASL, Mr. Rajiv Amrasuria, with convener assistant secretary, Mr. Pasindu Silva, and co conveners, Mr. Pandula Vanni Arachi. Mr. Oshan Ube Ratna, Ms. Anne Devananda, and Ms. Nikini Mapitigaman. I would also take this opportunity to thank the president of the BASL, Mr. Salia Piris, President's Council, and the other members of the management committees of the BASL for, for all their support and guidance given. I must say, ladies and gentlemen, that these webinars have brought together some of the most experienced and brilliant legal minds of the country. It has no doubt been extremely insightful and has also proven to be a useful tool of learning for our viewers. And today is no different. The topic for discussion today is Admiralty Law. Now, Admiralty Law is quite an interesting topic. It is also a very dynamic area of law given the rapid rise of international trade. I have no doubt that there is much to learn from our amazing panel of experts this evening. It is indeed my privilege and pleasure to welcome them all today. Before we proceed, however, let me give you a brief introduction to our panelists. First and foremost, we have with us Dr. J. M. Swaminathan. Now, Dr. J. M. Swaminathan is an attorney at law with over 57 years in practice. He holds an LLB from Ceylon, an LLM, Masters in Philosophy Colombo, and an LLD Honoris Causa. He was the former senior partner of Julius and Creasy and has served as a member of the Law Commission of Sri Lanka and also as a member of the Council of Legal Education and the Council of the University of Colombo. Presently, he is a member of the Office for Reparation Sri Lanka, a member of the Company Law Advisory Commission and also a member of the Intellectual Property Law Advisory Commission. Dr. Swaminathan is the chairman of the Board of Studies of the Council of Legal Education and also a consultant at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies of the Council of Legal Education. He is a member of the visiting faculty of the LLM course of the University of Colombo and is also an external member of the Faculty of Law Board of the Sir John Kotalawala Defense University. Dr. Swaminathan also serves on the boards of several public and private companies. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for joining with us this evening. We are privileged to have you. Also here with us today is Mr. Vikum D. Abru, President's Counsel. Mr. D. Abru is an additional Solicitor General at the Attorney General's Department of Sri Lanka. He counts over 26 years of experience in litigation as a counsel representing the government and other state agencies of Sri Lanka. Mr. D. Abru holds a Master of Laws degree on the law of the sea and shipping law from the International Maritime Law Institute in Malta. He has also been awarded a Master's of Law degree by the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. He currently serves as a visiting lecturer and examiner at the Sri Lanka Law College and has addressed conferences and workshops on the law of the sea, marine pollution, and admiralty law. In 2014, he authored the book on ballast water adequacy of the international legal regimes. 
Mr. Diabru has also written several articles for various magazines and law reviews on marine pollution, admiralty law, and civil procedure. Sir, we are happy to welcome you on board today. We also have with us this evening, Dr. Dan Malika Gunasekara. Dr. Dan Malika Gunasekara is an attorney at law of Sri Lanka, having 25 years of post-qualifying experience in the practice of civil and commercial laws. In 2001, he obtained his master's of law degree in international law with honors cum laude from the University of Utrecht, the Netherlands. He was soon offered a scholarship from International Max Planck Research School for Maritime Affairs, Germany, to undergo his doctoral studies in international commercial maritime law at the University of Hamburg. Dr. Dan received his doctorate in 2008 back in Hamburg after successfully defending his thesis titled Civil Liability for Bunker Oil Pollution Damage. In 2010, the book was published by Peter Lang Frankfurt. Since then, Dr. Dan has also authored many scholarly articles and other publications on the law of the sea and maritime law and other areas of the law. Presently, he runs his own law chambers. Dr. Dan is also a visiting lecturer in the law of the sea and maritime law in several local and international universities and other institutions such as the University of Colombo, University of Hamburg, Dalian Maritime University, China, and Simon University, China, Institute of Chartered Ship Brokers, and Institute of Commercial Law and Practice. He is a senior visiting lecturer for Bachelor of Laws, LLB, and Master of Laws program conducted locally in Sri Lanka by the University of Staffordshire, University of Bedfordshire, University of New Buckinghamshire, and the University of Southampton Solon. Dr. Dan was also appointed the Executive Director of the Ceylon Shipping Corporation by the Honorable Minister of Ports and Shipping in Sri Lanka during the years 2015 and 2017. He was also the Maritime Legal Advisor to the Ministry of Ports and Shipping and has also acted in several other boards as a director, including Ceylon Shipping Lines, Lanka Coal Limited, Ceylon Port Services, and CSC Candia. He is also an advisor on the, to the Marine Pollution Prevention Authority, Sri Lanka, and was a local delegate to the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission held in Nairobi in 2011. Dr. Dan was also the moderator of the National Maritime and Logistics Policy in Sri Lanka. Apart from his official duties, he also serves as a consultant to several leading shipping establishments operating in the private sector. He is a leading speaker at a number of global and regional forums and conferences held annually in different parts of the world in the field of maritime affairs. He is also the Sri Lanka representative to the Committee Maritime International and an executive member of the National Nautical Institute. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Dan. We are happy to have you on board. Finally, we move on to our moderator of the evening, that is Mrs. Dilumi D. Alvis. Mrs. Dilumi D. Alvis is an attorney at law, having over 17 years of experience in corporate litigation, arbitration, and other corporate legal matters. For over 12 years, she was engaged as an in-house counsel for Julius and Creasy, during which period she advised and represented key clients, both locally and foreign, in a number of litigation and arbitration matters. Mrs. D. Alvis has authored the chapter on Sri Lanka for the ICCA International Handbook on Commercial Arbitration and is the national reporter to the right to a physical hearing project of the ICCA. She is also the country reporter for the Text International Commercial Arbitration and Asia Pacific Perspective, second edition, and has also contributed to many legal articles. Mrs. Dialvis has a versatile academic track record, holding a master's in international trade law from the University of Wales, UK, conducted by the Sri Lanka Law College, a master's in law from the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka, Bachelor's in Science in Management from the University of Sri Jayawardenepura. She is also a past finalist of the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants, UK. Mrs. D. Alvis is also a chartered arbitrator. We warmly welcome you on board this evening, Mrs. D. Alvis. So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, 
I will now hand over the wheel to our moderator. I hope you have an interesting and enjoyable session. If you have any questions, please send them in via the Q&A box. Mrs. T. Alvis, over to you. Thank you, Joshua, for that warm introduction and a very good evening to all of you who are joining us today. Now, as all of you know, most of the earth is covered by sea. Sometimes we tend to forget this fact and focus mainly on the laws of the land. Our vision of law and legal rights most often stop at the seashore. But today, moving away from that, our topic for discussion is Admiralty Law. Now, there is a common misnomer or a misconception, I would say, where people think that the laws of the sea or maritime law are rather complex and complicated. So I thought it might be appropriate before we actually dwell into our discussion that I give a small introduction to the maritime law and to the concepts of maritime law. The laws of the sea is no different to the laws of the land. It is just that it takes place in the high seas. It takes place on a ship and perhaps slightly tweaked to bring in an aspect of international law, given the multi-jurisdictions that's involved. Now, if I'm to give, uh, put this into perspective by giving an example, we are all familiar with the concept of purchasing a property. Now, it may be a land, it may be an apartment, but in a purchase of an asset, there would be a conveyance. Similarly, in the case of ships, if a ship is purchased, there would be a conveyance. Then in the case of mortgages, now if one had a right to a land or a property, you could mortgage it to a bank and raise a loan. Similarly, in the case of ships, the ships can be subject to a mortgage and that mortgage will have to be registered in a particular register. Now, the same way, if you take leases, you may lease out a property and a long-term lease in shipping terms is what would be a bare boat charter. If you had an apartment and perhaps you wanted to give it out as a service apartment, the shipping concept of that would be a time, a time charter. So the list goes on. There are so many examples and parallels you can draw. Now, for instance, when it comes to an accident, a car might go and uh, meet with an accident with another car or somebody might drive in a car into somebody else's property and create a, a, a damage. In the case of ships, it would be a collusion at sea. The ship may collude with another ship. It may hit a jetty and it may have to sometimes be grounded. So the concepts which are there in laws of contract, laws of tort, property, are also there when it comes to laws of sea. The difference is that how you apply these laws. Because you see, in the laws of the sea, you're dealing with ships that travel across the sea, across different jurisdictions. So therefore, public international law, as well as private international law, has brought in mechanisms to deal with these various instances. Now, if I were to put the concept of admiralty law itself in the most simplistic form, with the uh, international trade advancing, countries started trading with different countries and ships belonging to these countries would go from port to port across different jurisdictions. Now, in doing so, these ships started to accumulate liability. They had to enter into contracts, uh, sometimes for their essentials like oil, uh, bunkering, then water. Sometimes these ships had to be repaired. And there were third parties who then got involved to supply goods and services to these ships. Now, given that these ships are coming from far off lands, if the owner of the ship was not known, there was a huge problem and a risk that was posed to the third parties who supplied these uh, goods and services as to how their claims would be met. 
It is as a solution to this problem that the law devised a mechanism whereby a ship was also given the same standing as an individual or a corporate personality. Now, we are all familiar with the concept of corporate personality when it comes to companies, where under companies law, company law, a corporate is recognized as a separate entity from its owners and it's given a corporate personality. So similarly, ships too were given this corporate personality and that is how the concept of admiralty laws developed. Now, after we uh, have our eminent speakers speak, present their uh, insights to this law today, I'm sure all of you who are joining us today will have a great insight to the law of ad admiralty, as well as I'm hoping that we will leave with you great insights so that the young practitioners who are joining us today will be encouraged to dwell into this area of the law. To start off today's proceedings, let me now invite our most senior panelists for the evening and a veteran in the field of the laws of the sea, my guru, Dr. James Swaminathan, to give us a brief introduction on the evolution of the Admiralty Law and also to introduce certain key concepts under this area of the law. Over to you, sir. Uh, so you're muted. So you're muted, sir. Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. All right, okay. So, as Jeremy has pointed out, we are discussing today the uh, Admiralty Law. Admiralty Law itself, as she pointed out, is a wide concept. It has got several, it includes several matters. She referred to conditions, then there is salvage, there is pilotage, there is a uh, charter parties, there is bill of lading, which, which incorporates carry the good by sea, and there is mortgage of vessels and, uh, and several other uh, issues. Now, I think it, is, it would not be practical within this limited time, the one, one hour or one and a half, one, one and a half hours, for, this, for us to go through the entire gamut, which is, of course, also very extensive. I believe in this tool, some, some some of, the, some of our practitioners and students may be aware that the British Shipping Series, the British Shipping Law Series, which are published by Sweden Maxwell, had six large volumes of books dealing with this matter. So the first volume of that book is Admiralty Practice, which was edited by Magufi, and there are now subsequently more recent works. So my presentation today is more or less more confined to the admiralty jurisdiction. Uh, I would like, I would try to, within this 20 minutes, a lot of to me, uh, very briefly, uh, uh, discuss the salient features relating to the evolution of the jurisdiction, historical uh, development of the jurisdiction of the admiralty court in the United Kingdom, in Sri Lanka, then consider the provisions of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act briefly, uh, particularly in relation to Section 2, and also, which, which is more or less parallel to Section 20 of the English Supreme Court Act of 1981, and uh, just refer to certain other uh, procedural aspects, and I'm sure. 
Mr. Vikundi Alvi, President's Council, and Dr. Dan Gunasekar would expand further on these relevant uh, matters. So, in, in the first instance, uh, as we can regard the evolution, historical development of the Emirati jurisdiction is concerned. Uh, according to certain authors, and I rely mainly on Professor uh, Mandarika uh, Shepherd, who is a uh, professor of maritime law at University College London and the founder of the Maritime Center there, who in, in her one of her works uh, 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 state that it's of ancient antiquity and can be and uh, it can be traced at least to the time of Henry the First. And then he says he says that by the time of the reign of Richard the 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 uh, Edward the Third, it was fairly well established that the crown or the sovereign had powers over piracy piracy matters in, within uh, the, the territorial waters of, uh, of 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 Britain. There was, of course, thereafter the, the law developed in the United Kingdom, and in the 14th century, particularly during the period 1340. To 1357 or thereabouts, there was a considerable amount of tension between the common law lawyers and civil law lawyers. During this period, the the, the most of the uh, uh, the the, uh, the Admiralty Court was basically a civil law court, and the practitioners who were permitted to practice in that court. Were, told, were said to be members of the College of Advocates and Doctors of Law. I think the word advocate, uh, we, will, some, some, we will recall prior to our Judicature Act, we had that distinction between advocates and doctors. And uh, so the same word appears in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the statute. In, uh, and they were the only people who were entire permitted to practice in the Admiralty Court. And according to uh, Meeson, whose work is now cited in almost all courts, uh, uh, he says that uh, uh, this continued until the, uh, during the time of King Richard II, the first Admiralty Act was passed. And uh, jurisdiction was given to the Admiralty Court. And thereafter, in, in about 1860s, 1959-60, the uh, College of Advocates and Doctors of Law died a natural death. And uh, the Admiralty Court was given the status of a court of record in the year somewhere about 1860. And thereafter, with the enactment of the English Judicature Act of 1875, the court became a part of the High Court and it was called the Probate Admiralty Divorce and Admiralty Division. During the 18, 1800s, 1800s, great, there have been very great, uh, the, most of the development of Admiralty law was that of Dr. Lushington who, who, and Sir Robert Fillmore, who were the uh, whose pioneering work is what has developed. Uh, into it, uh, admiralty law today, at least as far as the jurisdiction and the powers of the court is concerned. And uh, there is a, I, I think, uh, 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 case in, in the old case, which, uh, which can uh, give, give the history but I don't, I do not think I have a. I propose to go into that at this present moment. There are also textbooks which are started to give the development of the law very clearly. For anybody, anybody who wish to have an academic knowledge of this, particularly Roscoe's administrative practice, and more recently, Dr. Bishwal's um, uh, book on the history of the, the history and practice of the Bernardi Court in the 1800s published by Cambridge University Press. Now, thereafter, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, uh, some of the developments relating to 
the, the history, uh, I think, well laid down the judgment of Mr. Justice S.T. Rambaya in the case of Velaka. The Lordship uh, exhausted with dealt with this matter. And very briefly, if you were to say, it arose from the time of the in the in, the, in England when I, the time Sri Lanka became a colony, the, it was the Lord High Admiral who had the power of Admiralty Courts, and it was exercised through his deputy, the Vice Admiral, Vice Admiral, uh, who, who was the head of the court, and power was delegated to the colonial courts. Uh, to uh, to exercise the powers of the vice admiralty court, and the colonial courts were called the vice admiralty court, and the imperial parliament at that time laid down the rules relating to vice admiralty courts. Then, once the colonial court of admiralty act was uh, enacted from the 1890s, uh, the, there was provision given to the colonies to pass. Uh, for it to uh, establish their own court, and in pursuant to that, a colonial court of admiralty uh, ordinance was passed in Sri Lanka, and the Supreme Court was given the power uh, with a with a uh, with a right to appeal to the Privy Council, and the rules were published. Uh, procedure was published, and those procedures were in the in the uh, available even today. In volume one of the subsidy legislation 1956. Then thereafter, we had in Sri Lanka the Administration of Justice Act, which in part one referred, provided for the uh, administrative admiralty court, and that was repealed by the Judicature Act. And thereafter came the Administ Admiralty Act number 40 of 1983, which is the law that is in force today. Now, during the period of the AJL or the Administration of Justice Law and the Judicature Act and the coming into force of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act, there were certain lacunae, and those some of these cases of the during that period referred to these matters. And some, some of the more important cases are the case of Wildborn versus. Uh, in relation to this base, this is called Elaka. Uh, uh, then came the Aisha. These two cases refer to the some of the gaps at that time, but those are now more or more of historical interest rather than of current interest because we don't have those issues today. Now then, can we come to the uh, uh, main provisions of the? Uh, law as it is in today, and that is the law, which is the uh, administration of justice law uh, of, of uh, Act, Act, Act number 40 of 83. Now that gives the power to of the administrative of the administrative court. Now prior to that, I think uh, that it may be relevant to note that originally the the, the administrative court had power mainly in respect of those claims which are said to be maritime lien. Now, maritime lien is a, uh, it, it should be distinguished. I think uh, Dilmia also referred to it earlier in an uh, opening. Namely, maritime lien will have to be distinguished from a possessory lien or a statutory lien. A maritime lien does not require possession as such. It, in the moment, those claims such as salvage, Collision, uh, wages, and responded here. And more bottomary, that is a type of mortgage of once you mortgage of your keel of the ship, which is now more or less obsolete. But and uh, in, in those limited cases, uh, it, it, uh, it, the maritime lien attaches to the ship and it travels with the ship. It does not get itself discharged until uh, it does. It, it, it will it will continue until discharge, or a mortal say by lashes, which of course is a if if one is negligent and not pursue the your rights for a long period of time. So that was the what, what alone gave the right to a uh, 
action in REM. But subsequently by statute, this has now been extended further. And section two gives several categories of, uh, of, 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 of uh, in, in which in respect of which the action can be brought. And that in, the more common one that so far which have been brought in this country are basically for wages, both of the master and in respect to the uh, seaman. Then there is there are mortgage actions. Now, for example, the Royal Bond case was a mortgage case. Then there are cases related to salvage, the, 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 the Migamo case, which is also referred to the Sri Lankan case, which is a shipping trawler case belonging to the, ship, uh, ship, uh, the fishing corporation. That was a salvage case, which but lays down the principles of salvage, then fairly well. And, uh, and there are a number of cases relating to damage to goods in, uh, arising out of carriage of goods, that is agreement relating to carriage of goods on a vessel. And that is very common uh, where, where goods get damaged, particularly uh, on sea, and where there are claims for damaged cargo. In fact, uh, in the, when, uh, when the government was the sole importer of goods, particularly uh, sugar and rice, I think in the 1970s. Uh, uh, the, the food commissioner had quite a number of cases uh, or disputes uh, with the uh, importers in relation to damage or short delivery of, of rice and sugar. And at that time, the Attorney General Department was fully involved in several of those cases. So. Uh, but today, the state is no longer having a monopoly in the respect of rice or sugar. And I think those games are now uh, fairly uh, few. But yet, uh, damage to cargo, loss of cargo is still a matter. And this is, of course, closely connected with, uh, with uh, carriage of goods by sea. And we have, uh, in a case, for example, uh, a few cases where uh, that has been uh, discussed even in in the Supreme Court. I think cases such as uh, uh, um, uh, um, the 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 Skindia uh, uh, Steam Navigation Company Limited versus India uh, versus the Attorney General. Is just one example of that. Then even the Mozanik, Umbichi, Umbichi Limited versus Mozanik, that's 1998. That's another example. So these were the more, more important cases. Now, the, the question then arises is what can be arrested if that ship, that particular ship, or uh, what is called the sister ship arrest. Now, if that came into force, that concept of sister ship arrest came into force in 1956 in England and in with the enactment of the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act in Sri Lanka. There was considerable before be, between 1956 and 1981 in the United Kingdom, there was a, some confusion as to who a uh, book whether a charter vessel can be arrested, what is meant by beneficial ownership, etc. What is meant by beneficial ownership? Courts have they said beneficial ownership is, is a case where there is a cloak of trust and there is a distinction between equitable ownership and legal ownership. And it does not cover charters or operators or managers. So the then the, 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 that, that became clearer with the enactment of the 1981 uh, 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 law. Now, in the introduction, you may also refer to the fact that you are suing a ship. That is correct. Now, there were two schools of thought on that. One is what is called the personification theory, and the other one is what is called 
the, uh, uh, the, the uh, procedural theory. Originally, during the civil law, particularly when the civil law concepts were in uh, vogue in England, the, the, the personification theory had its, its uh, way. But later on, the procedural theory came into being. And once the, the writ of summons and the warrant of arrest is uh, issued and the owner appears, then it becomes just more or less like a action in persona. But if the owner does not appear, and if it is a strict action in REM, then it, uh, the, the, you are confined to only the vessel. And you cannot go behind uh, the, after the owner thereafter. Because once you have a judicial sale, the law is very clear, there is authority for that, that the person who buys it, bona fide, is gets it free of all encumbrances. So that is the basic theory. I do not with I have got a couple of minutes, I think. So just before I wind up, the, 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 that is basically the distinctions. And also one has to bear in mind, therefore there is a new, new decision which has come in 1993, Indian Grace Number Two, which has created a little bit of academic, uh, uh, academic uh, uh, provoked a lot of academic uh, writings about its uh, correctness. But it's a judgment of the House of Lords. Uh, the the main judgment being delivered by Lord Time, and he has overruled some of the earlier cases, uh, uh, which were uh, which were in force up to that time. And has stated, has given up, they developed the principle that upon the service of the writ, the jurisdiction the, the, of, of the court commences. And uh, this has this principle, is, and not, not really the appearance as far as the owner is concerned of the owner. Owner's appearance is, is not that relevant time. This was a case where the action in persona was originally instituted in India, and thereafter, on the same claim, the action was instituted in the UK, and the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and the Supreme Court and the House of Lords took the different views. So uh, that is a, just an overview. If we have time thereafter, we can consider any one of these aspects more, more in greater detail. I think I have, am I correct? Dilumi, I'm almost 20 minutes. Yes, sir. Am I right? Yes, sir. So I will, then I will leave, uh, give, give the floor to the other speakers and we will see what, what, the, what the questions are thereafter. And uh, if time permits, we can discuss any other matter in greater detail. Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan, for capturing developments over 100 years in such a short time span and in also in such a detailed manner. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Vikram Diablu, President's Counsel and Additional Solicitor General, who is a veteran in the field of admiralty law, to speak to us about the Sri Lankan legal position when it comes to admiralty law matters. Over to you, sir. Uh, sir, you have to unmute your mic. Thank you. At the very outset, I would like to thank the Bar Association uh, for giving me this opportunity to address this important topic, namely the law of admiralty. I thought I would do a slight presentation because I want to show you certain provisions. I, I personally feel that it's better if you can see that on the screen. So therefore, I would be sharing with you uh, my, my screen. Uh, hope uh, you can see that. Uh, right. Now, when we come to shipping, around 80% of the global yeah. trade by volume and about 
70% of the global trade by value are carried by sea. As you all know, vehicles are inherently mobile and travel from one jurisdiction to another. And ships change their identity within a very short period of time as uh, uh, as Dilumi Lusiti explained, because the ships, because the ship owners, they sell their ships uh, and buy new ships. So that's a big trade in the world. So when we come, when we talk about ships, it has both public international law aspect as well as private international law aspect. So private international law aspect is is basically uh, including the laws at Bradley. So I would like to share my some of my thoughts with you on public international law because I personally feel that it's important for you to understand this topic better. Now, now what you can see is actually a ship and a fishing vessel. It is also a fishing vessel. You can see a helicopter on, on, on board. And these are all fishing vessels. Now, there are so many, there are so many types of vessel. But it is important to know the legal status of a ship from the public law perspective. Because according to Rex versus Anderson, a ship is like a floating island of the flag state. A, a ship on the high seas carrying a national flag, that means the ship has to be registered in some jurisdiction, then only it will, can, it will have a flag, then it becomes the, it will become the ship of that, uh, ship of that country, is considered as, it's considered as part of the territory whose flag she carries. And, and importantly, all the old person on board are subject to the jurisdiction of the laws of that nation, that means the flag state. So in the no ship can do can can do international trade, trade without having a flag, so without being registered. A ship without a flag enjoys no protection under the international law. So this international, this is this customary international law position. That this is a flag, this customary international law position is now contained in both, in contained in the Law of the Sea Convention, and also international courts have held time and again, time and again approved this concept. Now, international law recognizes, as I said earlier, uh, several modalities of granting nationality to different type of ships. For instance, fishing vessels, the registration is different. So when it comes to merchant vessel, Merchant vessels are, when it comes to Sri Lanka, merchant vessels are registered. Uh, merchant vessels are registered uh, with the with the director general, uh, with the director general merchant shipping under the Merchant Shipping Act. Once the nationality is granted, the ship, everything on it, and every person involved or interested in its operation are treated as one entity linked to the flag state. So the moment the moment that moment if a if a different national is on board of a ship, if a different national is on board of a ship, uh, that person is subject to the laws of that country, not the country where where he was born, but of the uh, subject to the laws of the flag state. Now, just to give you uh, some idea uh, about how it operates, uh, as I said earlier, when the ship is when the ship is in the high seas, that is that is over that is two hundred uh, over two hundred nautical miles. Uh, that is over two hundred nautical. That is beyond two hundred nautical miles from the uh, from the coastline, uh, so the ship, the ship, no one can touch the ship of another state 
only in exceptional situations like uh, like piracy and so on a very exceptional situation so when the ship is in the territorial sea even when the ship is in the territorial sea that means the territorial sea the you have absolute sovereignty but but still you can't go on board of that ship that is traversing that tra that is traversing in the territorial in the territorial waters uh, in the territorial waters uh, once again i'm just uh so that is uh, that is little bit about that is little bit about the about the public international law uh, aspect and uh, so uh, so then i will now come to the private international law position and i come to admiralty law now why we need admiralty law as i said earlier the vehicles are inherently mobile and travel from one jurisdiction to another and ship changes it is identity by transferring ownership and also ship ships procure various services from suppliers during the voyage and when the goods are uh, transported they get damaged uh, due to the, the mishandling or due to some due to uh, during the uh, voyage and the whole purpose of ship arrest is to obtain security for the judgment of the court and not to punish the ship owner what we can see, what we have seen very often is that people people are of the misconception that arresting a ship is a punishment it is not a punishment it is only to get security for your claim now i come to uh, Uh, action in rem and action in personam mr dr swaminathan explain a bit the action in rem and action in personam uh, an action in rem is basically the action against the ship uh, ship and also in certain circumstances cargo or freight so the action in rem is basically a right against the whole world on the other hand action in personam like any other action we file is is an action against the owner to secure a claim but if you take these two and if you ask me what is the most common the most common is filing action in rem because action in personam is extremely difficult because the ship owner is in a different country the ship is in a different country so it is difficult to file a case against a person who is in a different country and therefore the the people the, and the, another reason is that most of these companies because the how a ship is registered is that uh, you don't need to I, I, because because traditionally the ships were registered in their own registries in their country but but nowadays what has happened is due to the flag of convenience if a person is having a ship he can register ship anywhere in the world people do that for financial gain because if you if you are a, if you are a national of a particular country and if you register your ship elsewhere in another country because you do it because there are standards are low and the the basically the cost is the, the operational cost is low and that is why they do it and how they do it how they do that is by floating a company in that new jurisdiction and that company is, a, is 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 considered as a legal entity of the of that particular state the citizen of that particular state and then that ship becomes the asset of that company so that is called flag of convenience and as the the another reason why you can't go against the against the owner owner is basically a company is that it's just a paper company and the only asset is the ship now i come to very briefly uh, the maritime claims and maritime liens then again dr swaminathan touched on this topic but very briefly just to give you a very brief outline and and i must tell you very frankly that maritime admiralty law is not a difficult subject as uh, 
as uh, uh, Dilluri uh, said earlier, because it's a very, sim very simple area, but of course people don't like to practice thinking that it's difficult, it's not difficult. Maritime claim, the difference between maritime claim and maritime lien is that every, every right, every, every claim you have is a maritime claim. But of course, under international law, uh, certain maritime claims are recognized by, by convention. Uh, and maritime lien means certain, certain maritime claims are considered as privileged claims. And they are called maritime lien. So that is the only difference between uh, that's the only difference between maritime claims and maritime lien. There is no secret there. Every claim is a claim, and certain claims are elevated, and they are called maritime liens. So they are privileged claims. If I may put it that way, they are privileged claims. So the, the maritime liens in Sri Lanka is set out in section 85 of the Merchant Shipping Act. And another most another important thing is that that important difference is that maritime liens follow the ship not be in the change of ownership until the ship is sold by way of a judicial sale. Generally, the maritime claims in most instances, extinguishes with, with the uh, after the sale of a ship. So that is the that's the main difference between maritime claims and maritime liens. So it, some people say it's confused, it's not confusing. Maritime lien is also a maritime claim, but it's a privilege claim. Now what now I will briefly explain the, the substantive and procedural law on admiralty. As uh, Dr. Swaminathan then explained. So the English law was introduced to Sri Lanka by the civil, uh, the civil law ordinance. And also then under section, uh, now section 31 of the Judicature Act, this is, that's a substantive law that the Judicature Act and the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act is a substantive law on admiralty. And procedure is contained in the, uh, in the admiralty Rules. So it's like the civil procedure code. Now, now when we come to we go to civil uh, civil uh, the civil courts, we follow the civil procedure. When you go to the admiralty court, we follow the admiralty rules. So that is the only difference. Now, now what? Now, now this slide explains to you the jurisdiction of the admiralty court in Sri Lanka. Now, when it comes to admiralty law. It is immaterial where the ship is registered or where the owner is, where the claim arose. So those matters are immaterial. What is material in an admiralty case is whether the ship is within your jurisdiction. So if the, if the ship is within your jurisdiction, now, now say for instance, if a, if a shipment has come from United Kingdom to uh, say, uh, say Saudi Arabia, so and claim arose there, but that claimant or the, or the and the the course of action arose there, but that claimant can come to Sri Lanka and arrest the ship if the ship is within the if a ship is in the Sri Lankan port. So the so the ownership where the action where the course of action arose all are material when it comes to admiral when it comes to the jurisdiction of the Admiralty Court. Now, these are the maritime claims you can see. I have a few minutes. I will uh, uh, the maritime claims in Sri Lanka. So these are the these are the old maritime claims that are set out in section 21. And, and as I said earlier, some of these, uh, as I said earlier, some of these maritime claims are there as liens under section 83 of the uh, of the Merchant Shipping Act. Now, how to exercise admiralty jurisdiction? Now, I have now this is a this is a very brief introduction on that. If it is a matter with regard to the ownership of the ship, mortgages, liens, and other charges, the action or the admiralty action has to be filed against the relevant ship. If it is a claim in respect of uh, 
section 21 e to q what you can see here is to e to q of the act whether it's a maritime lien or otherwise you can proceed against the relevant ship the relevant ship is here then you can proceed against the relevant ship on your so the relevant ship if the ownership has not changed the, at the time of committing the, the offense and also at the time of filing the action if the if the ownership that means the ownership has not changed that means the beneficial ownership of the charter by demise it has not changed you can go against the relevant ship and dr swaminathan also mentioned about the sister ship sister ship is the ships owned by the same company so you can go against the sister ship if the if the ship owner is the beneficial to the ship owner of the second ship that the sister ship is the beneficial owner of the sister ship at the time of filing the action so these are because i have summarized this uh, i have summarized this uh, this section this is section 34 i have summarized this a lot and this is the gist of uh, that provision and admiralty action starts like in like in the like the, now when we in the district court we file a plane but in the in the in the in the admiralty court we file so we issue writ of summons so you don't have to worry about what is writ of summons you don't have to worry about anything the forms are there so you just follow the forms that's it right there is no magic in it so every action in the admiralty court uh, commences with the issue with the issuance of a writ of summons then once it is uh, then summons shall be endorsed with a statement setting out the nature of the claim and relief so there is no plaint involved or anything at this stage then you serve then you, like in the uh, civil procedure court you serve summons to the ship then that person that ship owner makes an appearance and if the ship owner like the like it like when we file answer if you have a cross claim you can state that also in that appeal if the if the appearance is not recorded like in the civil procedure you you case can go ex parte and also the rem for me the rem is like partition actually it's like partition action is action against the whole world so therefore uh, so what is in, what is material is not the person who owns it but the subject matter so that any number of person having having interest uh, to the same ship can join in the same case so that is why so we have satisfy if if more and more ship parasta are made the sri lanka will gain a lot because the ship because other interested parties also come and retain lawyers in sri lanka uh, in the same action uh then the then at the same time the, the, the at the same time if there are, if if so many actions are filed in respect of the ship, same ship consolidation of action is also possible so the now this is the little controversial area for some for some because the warrant of arrest is taken because as you know because the ships they they travel from one jurisdiction to another so you want to stop for a moment the ship going from this jurisdiction to another jurisdiction so for that purpose you obtain the warrant of arrest warrant of arrest that they are in the in the in the rule so 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 the the whole idea of issuing the warrant of arrest is to allow ask the ship owner to come and keep security for your claim once the security is kept you can the ship can proceed then a uh, moment the ship is arrested the ship owner comes and keep security and he will get the ship release because if the if the ships are arrested then no ship will no ship will come from japan to sri lanka because it is also where various ports because the, the in shipping what happens is it is arrested next moment that person goes and keep security and get the ship release from that arrest because it is very common all over the world because the whole idea is to protect the rights of the it rights of the third party so the moment that is that is done can go because generally what happens is pni club protection and indemnity club they come and keep security in court and then allow the ship to go and also 
uh, caveat or caution against the arrest is also possible. So that if the ship owner is of the view that it might get arrested, you can file a caveat. And uh, another one or two minutes, is, is that okay, uh, Ms. Dilumi, to take one or two minutes? Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes. Uh, the pleadings, what are the, the, what are the pleadings uh, you have to file? Now, now there, generally, admiralty action can be heard without pleadings. Right. In the event the judge directs to file pleadings, the plaintiff, instead of filing a plaint in a normal case, plaintiff files a petition, and that's the only difference. And the defendant files answer. Now, how to file the play, petition and how to file the answer? Please look at the please look at the, the formats that are there in the admiralty rules. And rules also provides for interrogatories, discovery, inspection of documents, all that we do in, civil, in the civil court. Admissions of admissions of documents and facts is these there in uh, interrogatories from section 94 up to section 109 of the CPC, you can find all these provisions. So, so there is, this is nothing new. And the trial commences, the trial provisions are very much similar to section 150 to 153 of the civil procedures. So what you can do is you can take the civil procedure and the uh, admiralty rules and see and uh, compare and see how, uh, compare and see, so you can see it is, it is almost the same. Now these are the uh, admiralty, these are the, the, the headings of the admiralty rules, you can just see. Uh, and once the, after the case is over, the notice of sale has to be given to all lien holders and mortgage holders. If they are not there, oh, it has to be given. That is in terms of section 91 of the Merchant Shipping Act. So the most important thing is that once the ship is uh, sold, then all mortgages, liens, all will come to an end. So, so it, it will come to an end. So, the, so that is why you have to go and make your claim in that particular jurisdiction before it is sold. Because you can't, generally you can't arrest again in another jurisdiction. I'll come to you in the next slide. The, the priority, like, like uh, in the company set, the priority of claims are there, the priority. The marshals claim get the first priority, then claims maritime liens, mortgages, and other claims. And the, the, this is the last slide. Uh, and the, I also want to say that there's a, there's a lacuna in the law. That means if the ship is sold in this jurisdiction, so sometimes when it goes to another jurisdiction, it can get arrested. So that means the ship, new ship owner has paid money, but still it get arrested for a previous claim, uh, for a previous claim, and that claimant had not come to that particular jurisdiction. In order to address that issue, now there's an international instrument that is, that is being discussed. And that's called the that we have the Beijing draft, and actually I go and I participate uh, for this discussion. And the whole idea there is once it is once it is sold, that is to be recognized in all other jurisdictions. At the moment we have that uh, provision, but of course uh, uh, it is not universally accepted. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir, for that very insightful presentation. I'm sure it's going to be very useful uh, for practitioners. Now, I have often been told by my seniors that however much you may know a uh, provision in a statute, when you are handling a matter, you must read and reread that section because as practitioners, it's always very challenging to see how you can apply the existing law to a case at hand. Uh, Dr. Diane Malika Gunasekara, who is a specialist who specializes in the field of maritime law, will now share with us some of the issues faced by practitioners um, in a maritime or admiralty trial. Over to you, Doctor. Good evening, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this very uh, important and useful. Uh, webinar organized by the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. So uh, I'm very much privileged to be here with a very eminent panel to discuss about the Admiralty Law and thank you very much for passing the uh, uh, stage to me now. So I will be commencing my 
um, sharing of the slides. And you would see that uh, as Dilumi mentioned, uh, my main idea of the today's presentation is to discuss about the practicalities or the practical issues that the maritime agility practitioners face in our day-to-day -day court work with the Admiralty Court, uh, which is the, the, the High Court of Colombo or having commercial uh, jurisdiction or rather we call it the, at, uh, the commercial High Court. So now during my presentation, I'm going to cover these areas, but of course, some of the areas have been uh, aptly dealt by uh, Dr. Swaminathan, as well as uh, Business Council Diablo. Uh, so I will not be touching much on uh, those areas, but uh, going with some glance to uh, educate certain areas that were not uh, aptly addressed uh, during the uh, previous presentations. So as you know that uh, admiralty actions have two main modes in which the matters can be dealt with. That's the action in them where you file the case against the rest or the property or the action in persona where you file the case against uh, whoever who has the interest on the ship, mainly the, uh, the owner or any other party uh, that has uh, interest in the ship. Now, why we like to uh, uh, go for actions in REM is because that uh, the, when the ship is in our jurisdiction, we have uh, a more a possessive type of uh, right to uh, take or right to arrest the ship and arrest the subject. And that attracts more for practitioners. And like uh, my previous uh, presenters uh, mentioned that in actions in persona, uh, there are certain other uh, jurisdictional issues that may arise with uh, the finding of the, the proper person uh, who is liable uh, for our claim. So whatever it, uh, it is uh, now, uh, in the case of arrest of ships, that is uh, very much uh, concerned with the area of uh, REM matters, where the ship is the rest or the property, and that uh, we do have a, a, a privilege of uh, arresting the, the property. And there are, since the vessel can be on hold uh, by, of the, uh, by the court, there is no other reason to uh, have another property uh, to be to be uh, kept on frozen, uh, like available in the actions in persona, where we could uh, obtain freezing orders against the properties of the owner or any other party interested in the ship lying within our jurisdiction, so that we could uh, get uh, the court to order the freezing orders against uh, those properties. And uh, quite famously, we know about this Mareva injunction that can be uh, obtained uh, as a kind of a freezing order against the property of the owner. And uh, this Mareva injunction was a product of the case law that in, uh, in one of the cases in the, in the past, that uh, this Mareva injunction was introduced as a matter of having a security for the claim that came up in action in persona. Now, uh, Mr. Diablo was also talking about the nationality, flags of convenience, the uh, register of ships. Uh, now, in this area, uh, I would like to more specifically um, 
mention that uh, nationality of a ship is very important element because with the nationality, not only the registration that a ship is going to be entitled, but also it would be entitled for the flag of the state in which it is registered. Now, as Mr. Yabu said, then there is also the, uh, the, the possibility of obtaining uh, more than one flag, what we call the flag of convenience. And nowadays, it is renamed as flag of opportunities uh, due to the opportunities that are prevalent with or uh, 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 having a uh, uh, number of flags uh, in uh, different states. Now, what is very important here is that at any given time, she having more than one flag cannot fly more than one flag. So which means that having a number of uh, flags, uh, she can have only one flag flying at a given time. Now, there would be uh, some uh, concern why do ships need this kind of uh, 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 several flags? One of the reasons what Mr. Diabu also mentioned that due to tax reasons and uh, convenience of business in a certain uh, jurisdiction, a ship may opt to have uh, different types of flags. But also in addition, the advantage of having uh, different flags would be nowadays there, there are sometimes uh, the amenities uh, be between uh, uh, states that there are belligerent states. So when you enter uh, to uh, a certain state, that state might not uh, provide uh, the entry to a ship if, the, if that ship is flying a flag of a belligerent state. Uh, so that's the convenience that this ship will have when it has flags to fly. And uh, also, it is very much important that uh, the, the, the time in, at which a flag can be changed from one country to another only exists in the high seas. Only in the high seas that a flag can be uh, uh, changed from one uh, state to another. It cannot be uh, changed when a ship is within the exclusive economic zone of a country or within the territorial waters or within the port area of a certain country. So it has to be done while at high seas only. Then registration of ships uh, is very important because every country, whether coastal or non-coastal, maintain a ship registry. A classic example for a non uh, coastal or landlocked state is Switzerland. Switzerland uh, has uh, its own register of ships, and these countries do have also local registrations as well as international registrations to register international ships in a different registry, uh, not to mix with the local uh, flags, it, uh, the local registrations that it has given to local ships. More number is a very important thing because but that whenever ship changes its uh, name or uh, ownership or uh, it uh, goes into a different type of an owner by way of judicial uh, sale, the IMO number will not change. The IMO number is given by the IMO at the time of shipbuilding where we say the keel laying, at the time of keel laying, the structure of the ship is to be laid. At that time, the IMO number is given, and this number will stay until the ship goes into the cemetery, we say. Cemetery is the time that a ship goes into uh, scrapping. So until that, uh, the IMO number will remain. This is a very important element because having the IMO number is uh, is what we really need you know, in arresting a ship. Otherwise, there are, if there are certain like uh, two names, uh, one name uh, in two ships, one same, same name in two ships, it would be uh, a confusion uh, whether we are arresting the proper vessel. So with that, uh, the rest of the matters uh, I'm uh, going to discuss in my presentation. And what is important there is warranty of seaworthiness. Because in most of the admiralty cases, the basis of liability that uh, the claimant uh, may come up with is uh, where the ship has or ship is unseaworthy. If a ship is unseaworthy, 
the ship is not supposed to take in the waters. The seaworthiness of a ship is provided in almost all the uh, jurisdictions of coastal states and in their merchant shipping acts or the laws relating to the merchant shipping always say that any ship uh, of their flag must uh, comply and fulfill the seaworthiness uh, element. Now, there are three main elements in seaworthiness. One is that the ship has to be technically seaworthy. That means that the, the ship should be uh, properly equipped with its engines and uh, other uh, uh, technical and mechanical means uh, for it to take to the waters. Secondly, uh, the uh, voyage seaworthiness that it has the, the capacity to take up the voyage, so the competence of the crew, the insurance policies and the charts and uh, other uh, nowadays we, we, we do have the, uh, the GPS systems uh, and the navigation systems, so all these things have to be in place properly. And the third element of seaworthiness is that the purpose for which the ship is used, the ship should be purpose worthy. If it is a cargo ship, it has to be a cargo worthy ship. If it is a, a, a cargo ship that carries a um, 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 dangerous cargo, it must be fitted to carry the dangerous cargo and also must have the proper uh, uh, firefighting uh, things and everything to, to deal with. And also with regard to um, perishable cargo, uh, the refrigeration uh, equipments have to be uh, provided with. So seaworthiness is a huge area that in most of the cases I see that the basis of liability uh, in a claim, especially with regard to carriage of goods by sea, come with, uh, the, uh, with, the, with the complaint that the ship was not seaworthy. Seaworthiness is a nominate term as defined in uh, the Hong Kong Four versus Kawasaki Kitchen Kaisha case. There are, the court uh, held that uh, seaworthiness is not to be expressed, but not to be also implied, but it stands something in between that it's a nominate term, which is a very important term to maintain. Now, when we look at the carriage of goods by sea at number 31 of 1982 in Sri Lanka, section four of it requires the absolute warranty of seaworthiness to be maintained and, it need not, and, and not to be implied in the contract. It has to be, uh, it has to be taken uh, as a kind of an express term. So if you look at the Hague's Virus Article 1, the carrier is bound before and at the beginning of voyage to exercise due diligence uh, with regard to the maintenance of seaworthiness. So as we saw in the Starship case, the master not trained to use firefighting equipment, the court held that the ship was unseaworthy for, for that reason. In the fear of wind case, we saw that the court held the owner's, its owner, owner's duty to make it seaworthy cannot be validated even to a classification society where the class is given the owner's duty of executing due diligence does not uh, uh, does not uh, uh, end there, but his duty of uh, uh, having the exercise in the due diligence still remains to make his ship see that the, in the, the case of Sokol, the duty of due diligence arises at each different road port. Now, this is actually something what I have been discussing during the Express Pearl matter, that uh, in every single leg, the ship should be uh, seaworthy in order to carry the goods. So in the case of Satya Kailash, uh, it was said that negligent navigation by seafarers fails the seaworthiness test. This is also a very important element. And if in case the, uh, sh uh, the ship owner or the carrier could uh, uh, prove that his ship was seaworthy, then whatever happens thereafter uh, would fall into the area of peril of the sea, which cannot be remedied by uh, having seaworthiness of the ship. 
Then the next important uh, area that most of the practitioners come uh, into uh, conflict with in court is where these common and private carriers are involved. Because there are different types of carriers in the world uh, when it comes to sea carriage. Common carriers on one side, common carriers are mainly the liner service. We say sometimes we see uh, the MERS lines, uh, the Costco lines and so forth. So they carry uh, the goods on liner service. So only the particular space that is required for the carrying of the cargo container, you hire or on a freight. And uh, then on the other hand, you have the chartered vessels that can be uh, made by way of time charter party or on their boat charter party. So that's on fixtures. And sometimes there are blended operations also uh, that uh, certain common carriage and private carriage do coexist in a ship. And identifying the nature of the carrier is by the particular test that I have uh, mentioned here, which I will not go into detail uh, due to the time constraints, but I will go to the next uh, thing that the actual carrier uh, is one who carries actually uh, the, the, the owner or the carrier uh, of the ship. Uh, and then there are non-vessel owned carriers, but we see very commonly nowadays who uh, uh, hire their containers uh, for the goods to be carried on board the ships and they include also freight forwarders and other people. And uh, they are, uh, uh, the, uh, whether the actual carrier or an OC carrier, they are uh, bound by law of contract or in law of thought in case of liability uh, that exists. And then there are uh, different kinds of contracts that are incurred in the shipping field, like the charter parties, the contract of a freightment, and rules of lading. Rules of lading is uh, the primary, uh, the more fundamental document, but sometimes there may be situations where you will not be able to see a bill of lading because there are either charter parties uh, by which the goods are carried or uh, there's a contract of a freightman for several number of carriages or pack packages um, being taken to several number of um, uh, ships. So in Cultural and London versus Northwestern Railway, it was held that the common carrier may be sued for damages in thought if he wrongly refuses to carry any goods or passengers. So what is important here, and most of the practitioners do make uh, mistakes in court, is that the common carrier is strictly liable in the case of uh, a liability, and private carrier's liability is based on negligence. Then, um, the mode of release also, uh, uh, Mr. W uh, spoke about the mode of release, but I'm going a little bit further on that. There are the admiralty rules. Uh, section 37 is very clear that uh, the mode in which a, a arrested vessel can be released is either by the payment into court, amount claim, the price value of property arrested, amount of freight or cargo value in the case where only the cargo is arrested, not the ship. Then uh, you need to give the gold bonds uh, to the court, the, to the satisfaction of the court, or the guarantee or other security to the satisfaction of the court. Then on application of arrested party, uh, if the arrested party uh, is uh, making a proper submission that the ship can, be, uh, ship can be released, then if the court is satisfied, the ship can be released or either by the consent of a uh, consent in writing of the arresting party to discontinue or dismissal of the action. Then judge having discretion to reduce or increase amount with regard to all circumstances. Generally, the judge look at the, the relevant circumstances in which the judge can arrive at a certain quantum of uh, the, the particular bail bond or the amount to be uh, deposited with the court uh, for the release of the, the vessel. One part is a content of salvage. When it comes to salvage claim, only on the party's agreement that the ship can be released by, uh, by, by satisfying the court, the particular uh, security. In the, 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 the very famous case of the Moschetti, it was uh, uh, held that when there is no agreement between the parties, the court may decide on the type of what kind of bail bond to be given and the amount of security. So the bail bond can be either a bank guarantee or a, a, a letter of undertaking by the PNI club, 
or whatever. Uh, so amount of security is based on the claimant's best arguable case plus interest and plus plus cost. Generally, you know, we, we, when we uh, tend to uh, uh, decide on the on the amount quantum uh, for the security, uh, it's not the only the, the claim value, but also we look at the interest. Uh, at least for the next five years uh, or so, uh, plus the cost, including the legal cost for the five years that the claimant will have to bear. Now, the Southern Explorer case also there was uh, uh, the court held that there's a lot of consideration of all circumstances of the giver to be looked at, especially when it comes to uh, a retro undertaking. Now, my last slide is that give me about uh, three minutes, I will be finishing. Uh, so uh, my last slide is on the wrongful errors. This is also a very important area because uh, many lawyers who are uh, attending to admiralty matters uh, take up uh, uh, this position that the, the vessel has been wrongfully arrested by the claimant. Uh, so it is actually to waive their liability rather than as a defense. It's not really a defense. If there are certain defenses that are in the substantive law, but uh, the, the wrongful arrest is something uh, that the respondent or the defendant come up with to waive uh, its liability. So CSR, the, 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 anything about the wrongful errors or whatever the compensation to be paid for wrongful errors, uh, there are no provisions in the 1952 Arrest Convention uh, so that it pays way for the national law. Now, Sri Lanka is only a party still to the 1952 Rome Arrest Convention and uh, um, our national law is the more important one to look at when it comes to wrongful errors. Uh, in, uh, when the, the new arrest convention, the 1992, the Rome 2 convention allows on grounds of arrest is wrongful and unjustified, uh, the, the court may pronounce that the arrest was wrong. In the case, this is a very important case, the evangelismus case. It's a quite an old case, but the court held that there is no remedy for damages unless the arrest is done with bad faith or gross negligence. Only on those two circumstances, the court can claim or court can decide and determine that the arrest was wrongful on the ground that there was bad faith or gross negligence on the part of the claimant in arresting the vessel. Then what of reasonable and probable case is nowadays the main test to be, uh, uh, to be made in order to see whether the arrest was wrong. This is subjective as well as objective. So one of reasonable and probable cause is a very important. Remote possibility of an obligation of the claimant to pay damages because uh, it is very remote that uh, the defendant may be able to prove that there, there was a wrongful arrest. Now, proving of ownership is important here. Uh, because if we are going to arrest uh, the ship, uh, we only look at the ship, the, the rest. So the subject, the rest, the, and the party's connection as registered and beneficial owner are quite uh, yeah, important because when it comes to the naming of the relevant person, that they may be liable under action persona. Otherwise, the rest alone is sufficient in actually them to, uh, uh, to, to, to sue the, the vessel uh, based on the claim. Then the sistership concept uh, base, which was uh, quite uh, nicely explained by Dr. Swaminathan, the link is very important. How we define the link? Uh, is it the company, the corporate body that owns the number of ships nowadays? Uh, you call it the, the one company ship because a company is registered for only one ship. So if there are a number of ships of the same owner, they register different types of different companies. Uh, so, uh, but therefore, we have to find, find the, the proper link where we can identify, especially based on the registration and the beneficial ownership and whatever the other uh, the areas that we may have to look into because this is a very important area because once we arrest a, a sister ship, the, the, uh, the, the, the defendant might come and say that it was wrongfully arrested. There is no connection between the claim, uh, the, the vessel that we have the claim against with the vessel uh, that we have arrested as the sister ship. So determining the cost in wrongful arrest 
is the direct losses to be compensated and direct losses as trading loss. Um, so only direct losses will be in by the, the, the court and any trading loss, financial loss or legal benefits are too remote uh, because of the absence of legislative provisions. Uh, the, the matter of not um, opening up the floodgates would be uh, the main consideration uh, for, the, for, the, for the court uh, based on policy consideration. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, over to you, Dilip. Thank you, Dr. Gunasekara, for that insightful presentation. Uh, we have received a number of questions uh, from our participants. Uh, may I pose the first question to uh, Mr. Vikum Diabru? Uh, the question, sir, is as for the labyrinth of players in the maritime, that is ship owners, operators, managers, charterer, crew, and many others, do you think the present day's admiralty law is able to handle matters satisfactorily? Okay, uh, to answer that, to answer that question, uh, so we are not a party to 1952 RS Convention as well as 1999 RS Convention, but we are just following the English law at that time. Uh, so and uh, so there are there are there are a number of issues like in certain other jurisdiction, uh, you can arrest the ship now, now as I think uh, if there is a uh, most of the charter party and bill of lading uh, uh, contracts, uh, bill of lading and charter party contracts, you can see arbitration clause, right? So so uh, so the in certain jurisdictions like even in UK. You can arrest a ship for that arbitration that is held elsewhere as security in, in this jurisdiction. Uh, but that is not there in our law. So, uh, so that, is, uh, that is also a lacuna in our law because of that. So we lose a lot of business because arbitrations are held in London, mostly in London and in Singapore. And if the ship is in Sri Lanka, you can't just arrest as security for the arbitration in Sri Lanka, so that is, I think, I, I see that as a that as an area where we have to rethink and we have to see whether we have to rethink about our law uh, if we are to proceed uh, as a as a maritime nation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, may I pose the next question to Dr. Swaminathan? Uh, so the question is, uh, who are called? Any other interested say, states? other than flag state, please describe it. Dr. Swaminathan, could you answer that question, please? You're muted, sir. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right, uh, I think the question is any other interested party, I don't know what you meant by uh, the uh, next one, he said was well, other than the state. Other than the flag state. No, I think what, what you see when the warrant, I don't know what exactly the uh, person is really, the questionnaire is really asking, but what, what normally what happens is when the warrant is issued or the, or the, the written summons is issued, it says to the owners and any other party interested. Now that would include, for example, anybody who has a claim, such as a mortgagee um, uh, or any, any, any other interested party. But doesn't, I don't think it has reference to the flag. I, uh, unless, of course, um, the, the, uh, I don't know if the, the other panelists agree with me, but that, that is my impression. We'll move on to the next question. Dr. Gunasekara, if you could answer this. What role does the Marshal of the High Court play in an admiralty matter? Well, uh, that is a very important uh, question, I think. Um, because uh, a lot of uh, people, or rather the attorneys, uh, uh, make havoc uh, with uh, respect to uh, the, ma the matters that uh, fall under the marshal. Now, when uh, uh, an arrest is made by the High Court, the, the property of the rest fall under the custody of the marshal. The marshal is a state officer, he is generally the Director General of Merchant Shipping, and he is the person appointed by the court 
uh, for the uh, uh, for the upkeep of the vessel and to uh, keep in his own custody with uh, like safe custody of the vessel until the matter is disposed by the court or the subject vessel is uh, uh, released uh, upon uh, the security. So the, the position of the marshal is a very important thing. It's an official position, and generally the attorney general uh, so established knows that. Uh, they are also representing the, the marshal at certain uh, uh, junctures in cases. So the uh, attorney general uh, uh, represent the marshal in the court. So the marshal is an officer of the court. Marshal needs to be given the the, the, the fullest uh, cooperation by the parties, and he should his his uh, his uh, powers should not be taken for granted. By any of the attorneys or parties, because the marshal is the custodian of the vessel, uh, while, as I told you, as a, a, at Aras, and all the expenses and all other things uh, for the upkeeping of the vessel needs to be borne by him and he maintains uh, 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 an account uh, with regard to that, and also we have to show that in what, uh, that. In the maritime areas, it is one of the main uh, the claims that needs to be the, the first claim that needs to be uh, uh, settled in the case of uh, uh, auctioning of a vessel or judicial sale of a vessel, uh, where the marshal is entitled not only for the uh, for the for the for the expenses that he has borne, but also a commission based on the sale. So the marshal's duties are very important. He is the custodian. Uh, on behalf of the court of the vessel, and he should be respected uh, for that purpose. And uh, all matters that need to be attended by the parties need to be addressed to the marshal, and through the marshal only that uh, the the, uh, the the vessel needs to be attended to. Generally, the court also um, direct the marshal to maintain the status quo of the vessel once it is arrested. So the marshal is under a duty to uh, maintain that uh, status quo for the vessel. So I think uh, that suffices uh, the, the question that was raised. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the next question I will pose once again to um, Mr. Diablo since you touched on the question of arbitration. So the question is, if there if there is an arbitration clause in an agreement between two parties and a dispute arises between parties under the said agreement, can an arrest be made irrespective of the arbitration clause in the agreement? Uh, and we have another question which is similar to that, so I'll post both questions to you. Will our courts accept jurisdiction over the substantive claim once a vessel has been arrested? Maybe you can touch on both matters, sir. Right. Uh, to answer the first question, uh, of course, uh, we have uh, judgments, two different schools of judgments. So, if uh, now uh, the cases like Scarlet Shipping Company, uh, so that is the uh, Thermopylicera case, uh, the court of, and, and in fact, uh, now, in fact, I have written an article on arbitration and I have stated all that in that article. That was published in 2016 BSLO journal. Uh, all these uh, steps are also set out there. In that case, the Court of Appeal uh, was of the view that the claim arising out of the Charter Party Agreement should be referred to arbitration without adjudicating the claim in the Admiralty Court. So that was the that was the position. However, so recently, not recently, of course, in 2014. In the case of Colombo Commercial Fertilizer versus MB Mumbai, the Court of Appeal held that, uh, having considered both the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act as well as the Arbitration Act, held that Arbit uh, Admiralty Court may entertain a claim under the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act in spite of Section 5 of the Arbitration Act. So, so that is the position now. But second question was not very clear to me. If you could uh, repeat that question. Uh, uh, so the, the Villa courts accept jurisdiction over the substantive claim once a vessel has been arrested. Villa uh, court, uh, can, I, can I say whether that? We, whether we will go into the substantive claim, sir, now the arrest is in respect of a claim. Yes, certainly yes, certainly yes, certainly yes. That, that's what I said. 
in in our in sri lanka we don't have uh, we don't have a system where you arrest only for the purpose of security and the matter is uh, arbitrated or litigated elsewhere but moment it is arrested here the sub, the court will go into the substantive matter yes thank you sir uh, dr swaminathan if you could uh, help yes. us with the next question the question is uh, if you get judgment against a ship and the ship is sold but you don't yes. get sufficient funds to satisfy your claim then what do you do can you sue the owner of the vessel in personam for the balance yes uh, the traditional view has been that you can sue the uh, the 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 owner for the balance but in the right as i told you in 1993 house of law decision in india express number 2 seems to suggest that this is really confined to actions in rem proper that is which are not quasi rem or statutory liens and i think uh, some authors like neeson have taken the view that it is limited to actions strictly actions in rem so but general view is that in most cases there there are statutory liens you can proceed to get the balance whatever the amount you thank you sir uh, dr gunasekara the next question is to you uh, on what basis can a party intervene in an action in rem and on what grounds uh the intervention of parties is mentioned uh, uh, very in the uh, in the advocacy rules and uh, the inter intervention uh, uh is subject to the the court um uh, trying the matter uh, allowing such intervention that is number one so it's on the discretion of the judge number two is that the intervening party also has to show that he has the same defense as of the ship because the matter is against the ship woman so therefore in such a case uh, uh the the intervening party uh, the defendant has no other uh, claim that so no other defense then he defends the uh, the uh, the ship itself like the same defense that the ship may have the intervening party will have because originally the action is an action in rem so which is an action against the property action against the vessel so that is the reason why the court number one will give in discussion uh, either give or not give uh, the uh, the the intervention opportunity if it gives then the intervention should be uh, specifically on the ground that uh, the defense prevailing for the defendant is same in line with the defendant as well thank you doctor uh, uh, actually you may know if i may answer the earlier question i think it's clearly stated by for example meeson says that a judgment in a claim that is truly in rem is not a bar to a subsequent claim in person so that is a law as uh, today uh, so you, can law. Pursue, you can pursue you can pursue a judgment in claim truly in rem is not a bar to a subsequent claim in person thank you sir uh, mr diabo uh, if i may pose the next question to you is it possible to have a ship sold pendant lite if so how long would it take the yeah, provisions are there in the admiralty rules uh, the, the provisions are there uh, how, how how would it take or uh, of course uh, it is generally done when actually when we are talking about ship arrest we talk about on not only the ship arrest but even the cargo arrest uh, arrest of cargo if it is subject to speedy decay so generally this kind of applications are made uh, so how long would it take uh, so of course uh, uh, so i mean there is no time to period where so when you make an application there will be a appraisement uh, and then there can be then the ship can be sold i mean the appraisement and sale is there in the admiralty rules thank you uh dr malika if you could answer this question uh, can a territorial jurisdiction of the admiralty court be extended 
beyond port limit in arresting a vessel in a situation of a pollution incident, such as the incident of the empty New Diamond. Now, this is a very, uh, uh, very important area and also a very good question, I would say, because, you know, generally under the Admiralty Jurisdiction Act, the jurisdiction of the court is, uh, is uh, exercised when a ship is within uh, uh, our waters and also on, on the basis that it, it reports to one of our ports. Because uh, it is the, the cardinal theory under the law of the sea convention that the innocent passage of a ship should not be hampered. And I also uh, heard uh, while Dr. Mr. Diablo was talking about uh, the, 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 the ships that only traverse other waters for the purpose of traversing uh, shall not be arrested unless uh, the ship is calling at our port. But there are also English. Uh, legal uh, uh, case laws, uh, sorry, English case law that have uh, shown that uh, even in such a case, uh, still the court of England can arrest a vessel. But however, uh, the cardinal theory, as I told you, under the uh, law of the sea convention, uh, a ship should not be arrested if it is not calling uh, a port of that country because that would hamper the innocent uh, passage. Now, getting back to the question, uh, what you raised, now, uh, according to section two, subsection three of the uh, Admiralty Jurisdiction Act, it very clearly says that the jurisdiction of the court under paragraph uh, B of section one includes power to settle any account uh, out uh, any account outstanding and unsettled. Uh, sorry, uh, subsection four. I have to read the jurisdiction of the court under this includes the jurisdiction to hear and determine any claim in respect of a liability incurred under the Marine Pollution Prevention Act number fifty nine of eighty one by reason of discharge, escape, dumping, or any pollute of Sri Lanka waters. Or by ship. So now the share, this particular the, the act has been uh, uh, amended. Uh, the, the present date is number 35 of 2008. So we can argue on the basis that uh, it's the same uh, law that would apply. So therefore, our Admiralty Court has jurisdiction. But unfortunately, there is uh, no case has uh, yet come uh, with uh, this kind of a complexity. Uh, of the law, uh, because the, the New Diamond case, uh, uh, there is no yet uh, legal proceedings that have been performed in the Sri Lankan court, uh, and it happened within the exclusive economic zone of Sri Lanka. But according very uh, plainly uh, um, interpreting our act, that would uh, provide the jurisdiction to our court. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, our next question, I will post it to Dr. Swaminathan as he actually touched on it uh, during his presentation. Uh, what is the position as regards sister ships and ships in associated ownership? No, associated ownership would not would be it has to be beneficially owned. So be, that means all shares of the entire ship ownership, both legal, the legal and beneficial, should be with that party. So. Uh, that is where, uh, for example, uh, there have been cases where the, the, the question of piercing the veil, for instance, to see whether the ships are owned by the same person. There are a number of cases, uh, for example, the maritime trader, the Evinoc, um, the Evinoc case, which, is, which said you cannot. And cases like Saudi Prince, for example, uh, where, uh, where, for instance, they have taken the view that if you can, depending on the circumstances, that if you can show that after the, for example, the the the, the, the writ has, of summons has been issued, there has been a transfer. But otherwise, to arrest the vessel, the other, other vessel also should be beneficially owned by the person, the relevant person, that is the person uh, in who 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 was in charge of the vessel at the time when the so-called uh, wrong was committed. Uh, thank you, sir. Our final question, I will pose it to uh, uh, Mr. Diabru. Uh, can you arrest a ship irrespective of her flag? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, sir, you're muted. As I said earlier, the requirement is that 
uh, the 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 ownership because because I, because I explain the uh, private international law and public international law. Public international law means the state can't go and arrest a vessel, but of course a person can arrest a vessel vessel for a private claim. So 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 this is uh, flag is immaterial. Where the cause of action arose is immaterial. Owners or the the residence of the owners are immaterial. You can arrest the ship here. Only requirement is that ship is in our port. If the ship is in our port, we have jurisdiction to, uh, to decide that matter, arrest and decide that matter. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank the panelists for this evening, uh, Dr. James Vaminandan, Mr. Vikum Diabru, and Dr. Dan Malika Gunasekara for sharing your thoughts and insights into the law of admiralty. I now hand over the floor to Joshua to take us to a conclusion. Over to you, Joshua. Thank you, Mrs. T. Alvis. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I must thank our wonderful <laughs> panelists for that insightful session. I'm sure all of our viewers joining in today gained something from today's productive webinar. Before we wrap up for the evening, I must inform you that the first BASL Children's Day workshop takes place tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. It is a craft-based workshop under the theme, Small Hands Change the World. The workshop is for the children and grandchildren of the members between the ages of five and 10 years and will be conducted virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, we also continue the professional, personal and career development webinar series tomorrow, commencing from 7 p.m. onwards to 8.30 p.m. The topic for tomorrow's webinar is on financial management and investment planning for lawyers. So do join us again tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, for yet another interesting session. Until then, have a good evening. Thank you.